Amen and amen. Hello, everyone. Can you give Gino a clap offering? It's his birthday today. Happy birthday, Gino. But uh, hey, everyone, welcome. I'm so excited because uh, it's my first time to speak again in a couple of weeks. And so a lot has been placed upon my heart by the Lord. And uh, I pray that uh, as he has spoken to me the past couple of weeks on this message, he will also speak to you. Do you like reminders? Do you like reminders? Uh, can I, yes, do you like that? You know, some kind of reminder sometimes drives me crazy. You know, for example, I don't want to be reminded that I need to get something that I search online. Gano ba kayo? You, when you go and you search something online, then you, you go to your social media apps and then everything that you search on automatically comes now and reminds you to get and to buy. Other reminders, you know, uh, like subscription. Na laging kung gusto ko daw kumuha, but I said no already. But there are also good reminders, like for example, meetings, or preaching schedules, or birthdays, or things that allows me to be reminded of. I'm glad that a pop-up notification on my phone reminds me on something that is very, very important. I don't mind being reminded by that. That's why I like this text from C.S. Lewis when he said, people need to be reminded more than they need to be instructed. Do you agree? That oftentimes we need to be reminded more than we need to be instructed. A lot of people, when they go to church, or even in our life in general, they always say, hey, I already know that. Tarinig ko na yan. Or, I've seen that material before. I will zone out already. Or, there's nothing new in this presentation that I'm hearing right now. We think because we have heard it before, we know about it. But the reality is, even if you know already about it, oftentimes, we don't do it. We need to be constantly be reminded of. And that is actually my takeaway for the past couple of weeks as we have been going in this series called Victorious Living. Right? This series on Victorious Living. Because it's important, because the reality is, we need to be reminded repeatedly before the information actually sticks. Or we need to be constantly be reminded before we apply the information. Again, it is easy to say, I know that already. But equally, totally a different ballgame when it's about applying it into our lives. So, let me ask you this tough question. Do you really know already? Or is it you've something that you've heard, but you haven't really actually learned? That's a nice question to ask. Or, if you're here, and then you would hear me speak, and you would say, hey, I already know that already. Well, my question is, are you already applying it into your lives? I think these are amazing questions that we need to do it. But some of you are here who would hear this message and would say, I've actually heard that message. But what do I need to change in my life with this message that the Lord's actually telling me about? And that is the framework that I wanted to set the stage up. Because I hope and pray that your attitude here is not, I know that, or I know that already. Don't, don't take that attitude. Rather, take it as an attitude of, wow, this is a great reminder for me to really understand what is God telling me. Because most of us, we know what to do. We just don't do it. That's why we need to be reminded more than we need to be instructed. And victorious living is a constant reminder I think if you've been joining us for the past couple of weeks, we've been doing this series for the past couple of weeks in the book of Joshua, if you would really try to understand, meditate, and study these 24 chapters, it's actually basically saying the same. That's why tonight, or today rather, as we close out our series on the book of Joshua in chapter 23 and 24, the contents of chapter 23 and 24 are a bit similar. It's Joshua's final message to the people. Final. And if it's a final message of Joshua, then we need to understand what actually is this guy telling us because this guy is in the tail end of his life. In fact, in chapter 24, it mentions that he's already 110 years old. And so he has gone through a lot of stuff. And this morning as I was preparing, I noticed that there are 49, chapter, 49 verses, okay? 
So I only have uh, 54 minutes left. So it will be practically impossible to talk about 49 verses in 54 minutes. So what I did is, what I've been praying to do is, I will touch on just some of the key verses without sacrificing the actual message of these two chapters. Because the two chapters are similar. And so what we're going to do, so you don't get lost, okay? We're going to shuttle in from chapter 22 to 24, then balik tayo 23, then balik tayo 24. But more or less, we're going to take these two chapters as one. Because clearly, this is a single message, a farewell message that the leader, Joshua, the soldier, is actually imparting and telling them. I highlighted a few key verses. The title for this morning message is taken from this verse, verse 15. And I highlighted some key points here. Choose whom you will serve. This is the demand. This is the command of Joshua in the tail end of his farewell message. Choose whom you will serve. And then Joshua reinforces his position. But as for me and my house, we will what? We will serve the Lord. And that's why the simple message for this morning's the simple title for this morning's message is Be Victorious, Choose God. Can you please tell this to the person seated beside you? Be Victorious, Choose God. Hey, can I ask you a question? What would be your last words? Have you thought about this? I know it's kind of morbid on a Sunday morning. May matutulog, ko lang. What would be your last words would be? If it's going to be your last word. I was thinking, ano yung gusto kong sabihin? sa mga mahal ko sa buhay, if it's going to be my last few words. Not drink water. But actually, what do I want them to be remembered when I'm gone? What would be the legacy that I will be passing on? Perhaps, some of you, you want to let your people that, that you love, how much you love them. Normally, that's Dana, di ba? That's normally what they say, I, the, 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 the people that you love. Or, perhaps, just like Joshua, you're going to give them an advice on how to live. And what did Joshua leave them? I summarize the 49 verses into this, and I submit to you, this is what Joshua, among all the other things that we will be discussing this morning, on what Joshua wanted to tell his people, and wanted to tell each one of us this morning. That if you are here, and you are the one that is living or not living a victorious life, and you want to really experience victory in your life, there are certain challenges in your life, there are certain things that's bothering in your life, you feel defeated, there's a challenge, there's a sinful uh, lifestyle that you're doing that you can get ahead of or that you can get away from. Or if you're here, you're burdened with a lot of problems, probably health issues or certain things that is pressing you down. Well, God's message to each one of you is this. Choose God. Joshua expressed this. He said it. He, he has this deep concern. He has this deep concern for the people of the Israel when he's about to leave because he noticed that there was a growing complacency in the Israelites, in the, in the Israelites' lifestyle towards the remnants of the Canaanites that have stayed in the promised land. If you're here and you've been joining us, we have been going through this journey of the Israelites claiming God's promise of land. It is a possession that was promised to them. And now, at the tail end of Joshua, they're experiencing this benefit. They have been they are already in the land. But in this land, that where they are right now, the promised land, in this land, there still remain some remnants. It was supposed to be exclusively theirs. But because of complacency and perhaps of disobedience, They've allowed these Canaanite people to stay. And so Joshua, Joshua was very, very careful. He was concerned. He said, you know what? There are still people, the Canaanites, living in your midst. And therefore, if you want to experience continuous victory in your life, and if you're here, that is what you want, continuous victory in your life, you got to understand there are certain things that you need to do. And that is our simple three-point message for this morning. First, we need to choose God because God is faithful. I love the songs earlier. It talked about God's faithfulness. And if we are going to choose God, we need to obey. We need to set apart and we need to serve. And then later on, I'm going to close it in 
on how do we really bring this all home and why we truly choose God. So our first point, God is faithful. Do you honestly believe this, that God is faithful? I mean, this is, this is something easy to say. This is something easy to say. Yes, God, you are faithful. But I tell you, it's another thing to apply it into our lives. Joshua pointed them to God. In his close-out farewell message, which is chapter 23 and chapter 24, he did not talk about himself. You know who he talked about? He talked about the accomplishments of God. He lived 110 years, and he had so many successes. But as I was studying these 49 verses, never did Joshua alluded anything about himself. He specifically pointed them to God and asked the people to remember God's provision, to choose God, and to cling to him. Look, look, in verse 23, verse 22, Joshua was old. He was already advanced in years, right? Again, he reiterated, I am already old on every side. Sorry. Joshua was very old, right? Joshua was very old, advanced in years. And that's why at this point in the, in the narrative as we start chapter 23, Joshua informs the people that, hey, everybody, we're given rest. Now, Israel, after years of having wars in and out, is now experiencing rest. In fact, given rest to Israel for over two decades. Biblical scholars says about 25 years of rest. So they were actually having rest. And so at the tail end of what Joshua had accomplished through God's power, and again, he says, I am old, advanced in years, reiterating that what he is about to say is of critical importance because he has the wisdom. He had the experience. He knew that he had to go all through this so that he will get something that he can share to the people on what is important for them. They would, they, they, this is the story that the Lord has given them rest. And that The challenge here, and, and similarly, all of us here are in the same boat, for some of us here, whenever we experience blessings in our life, you know the challenge? The blessings in life is we tend to drift away. It is a reminder that we all need. It's human nature. That's why don't you notice sometimes when you're having fun and something changes the dynamics of your life, then all of a sudden you think of God again. That's the nature. That's human nature. And that's why Joshua was reiterating this. He's coming from a place of experience. And look, look at how he started it off. He started off with this. He who has been fighting for you. The point that Joshua is trying to reinforce right off the bat that God is faithful. He begins his address by giving glory to God. It would have been easy for Joshua to focus on what he has done as a military leader, diba? Right? He has accomplished so many, the, 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 the walls of Jericho, Ai, the Amorites, the Hittites, all of these, because it was truly an impressive feat. But folks, you see Joshua, he's not interested about glorifying himself. He was interested in glorifying God. And that is something that we need to embrace. Because if you truly want to become faithful in what God is asking us to do. Then we need to understand that we need to experience. And you have seen all the Lord your God has done. There are people perhaps in this place as big as this that you need to be reminded of what God has done in your life. You need to be reminded. Because when you are reminded of what God has done in your life, the challenges that you're experiencing right now, the difficulties, and perhaps the anxiety that you are seeing in the future that might arise from the complications that you are in right now, in the mess that you're in right now, that is the antidote. The antidote is God is faithful. And that is something that you have to embrace. And the reason why the Lord brought you here is because He wanted you he wanted to remind all of you, all of us that it is He who has been fighting for you. You need to hear this. We need to hear this. Because a lot of Christians in church oftentimes live defeated lives. Live lives na counting challenge, counting problema, you get knocked off. I share to you in my life, I have been knocked off so many times. But as I look back 
on those issues, on those challenges, on those problems, God will always remind me, hey, Ikoi, haven't I been faithful? Haven't I been faithful? God is he who is fighting for you. He is fighting for you. And more, more than the reminder of Joshua back then, in those times, in the now. Look at the encouragement. First Corinthians chapter 15, verse 57. Everybody, could we all read this and claim this? But thanks be to God who gives us the victory to our Lord Jesus Christ. Today, it is the same. If we look back in our lives, all of us who have experienced real victory in our challenges will admit in humility We'll admit in humility, it is truly, it is God who did the fighting for us. So today, right off the bat, I really want to spend time here. It is God who is fighting for us. We need to be reminded of that. That God is the one. Jesus is the one that did everything in our lives. Jesus, unto eternity, he gave us eternal, eternal salvation. In the now, he is giving us power over victory over our sin. Do you know that? Because of the Holy Spirit and the power of Christ in our lives, we could truly overcome those sinful desires that we have in our lives. So if you're here and you feel, I have something that I cannot overcome, I have something here that I cannot challenge, it's something here that I'm struggling with that I can't do anything about, well, folks, that is a lie because God says, I am faithful. And if I give you a command, I am faithful to empower you, to give you the enablement to fulfill that command. And so don't feel defeated because it is Jesus Christ who is fighting for us. That's why we choose God because God is faithful. He's faithful. And later on in the chapter, in the same chapter, look, and you know, a wonderful verse. Everybody, could you read this with me? And you know, in all your hearts and in all your souls that not one word of all the good words which the Lord your God spoke concerning you has failed. They all have been fulfilled for you. Not one of them has failed. Wow! I can repeat this verse over and over again. Can you truly say this? That today we realize that this is actually true? Imagine this. For those of you that have been following our book of Joshua series, imagine this. The Israelites have been disobedient. The Israelites have been unfaithful. We read the story. We read the chapters. They doubted God. They gave in to idolatry. Yet somehow, God was the one who brought them through. Yes, it was difficult. It took them 40 years. Some said it should have taken them a few days, but it took them 40 years because of disobedience. But yet, amidst it all, God provided for them. Folks, I can personally attest to this. I have faced so many battles in my life. Our church, our church has faced so many battles in our life. I know of people here in this hall Personally, I know them. And I know that they have gone through a lot of battles in their life, who face mountains of problems. And yet, amidst those difficulties, I submit to you, God fulfilled the promise to take care of his people and to take care of his church. We all need to hear this today. God is fighting for us. God has been faithful. And you know why he is faithful? You know why he's faithful? You know why he's faithful? He's not faithful because we are faithful. He is faithful because that is who he is. We don't deserve it. We, we, we don't deserve it. You come here, you might say, hey, I served you. Hey, I've given everything to you, Lord. I've surrendered my life to you, Lord. I deserve this, Lord. No, 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 no. We don't deserve it. But you know why he's doing it? Can I share to you why he's doing it? In this 49 verses that I've studied over and over and over the past couple of days, there's one phrase that stood out. In this phrase, one thing stood out, Lord your God. That phrase, Lord your God, is a technical phrase. It's a covenantal phrase. 
it is something that is used extensively in the Old Testament that talks about the relationship. Check this out. You know, the Lord your God, the Lord your God, the Lord your God, the Lord your God. So many Lord your gods. You know, the Lord your God, the Lord your God, the Lord your God. It is a covenantal relationship. One of the most important theological doctrine in the Old Testament. What is this doctrine? This doctrine is that He is my God, He is your God, and we will be His people. I claim that because a lot of people in the church don't claim that. You come here, we come here, we sit down, and we say we do this out of, you know, just to, just to show God that He's important to us. But more than that, we come here because we worship the Lord. The reason why we're so passionate in asking people to bring people to church nowadays, because people go to church nowadays, they don't really go to church to worship God. A lot of people, we go to church just to go to church. The motion. Oh. This word, the Lord your God, is a covenant. A covenant that means it's a promise. A covenant means it is God's promise to you and I that He is our God. And now if He is our God, He is mandated. He has the responsibility to tell us, to love us, to take care of us, to provide for us. And that's why Joshua started with this. He said this over and over and over again. 13 times in 9 verses. So clearly, Joshua wanted to emphasize that there is a relationship. Why do I need to harp on that? Kasi kung nandito ka, at tatay mo talaga ang Panginoon, then why are you acting as if you don't have a God, a Father who loves you? That is what the covenantal mandate is. Another key idea that I that I that just jumped out of the page when I was reading these 49 verses is this concept that when Joshua in, ver- in chapter 24 was now providing the history, remember in his farewell address, he had to recount, he needed to recall, he needed to remind the people of the Israel's history. And as I was reading these verses about the history of Israel that Joshua was telling them, I, I saw this overriding statement in verse, in chapter 24, in verse 1 to 13, it's in your Bible, if you have it, it's called the review of the Israel history. In that review that Joshua is sharing in his farewell address, some key points that I wanted to reemphasize. Number one, when he gathered all the people in Shechem, look, he got all the people in Shechem. Joshua did all the gathering, right? But look, look, they presented themselves before God. So you see, when we gather here, you're not being gathered by a pastor. You're not being gathered by the team, the core, your dear leader. No, no. The reason why we're gathered here is because we are being presented to God. This is your act of worship. This is your act of worship. That's why if you choose God on a Sunday to come here and honor and worship God, that is your act of worship. And look, Look at what Joshua was saying. This is what the Lord says. He's very, very careful that in this farewell address that he's saying, this is what the Lord is saying. I am not saying this. This is what the Lord is saying. Similarly, I stand here in front of you telling you that this is not what I'm saying. This is what God is saying. And in his review, here's an amazing, interesting fact. In this review, Look at how the personal pronoun I was used by God several times. In fact, I counted it 17 times. I took him. I brought you out. I did. I handed. I delivered. I gave. I sent. All about God. I gave you the land. So in this historical summary, the personal pronoun I was Joshua was reminding the Israelites. Hey, guys. It is God who authored, promised, and provided those milestones in our history. An important doctrine that we need to teach the church today. That it is God. 
It is not us. It is not your giftedness. It is not your money. It is not your talent. It is not that that God is so pleased with. You know what He's pleased with? Our heart. Our heart. And it's why verse 13, I highlighted this, is another key theological verse. Because look at what verse 13 is saying. After he rattled off all the I, 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 the personal pronoun, look, look, check out verse 13. Which you had not labored, which you had not built, which you did not plant. Why? Why all of a sudden, after all of those verses of claiming Jesus, uh, God did all of these things, he then said, you had not labored, you had not built, you did not plant. Certainly, the Israelite people confronted their enemy. We've seen that. Obviously, they engaged the dangerous battles. We've also read that. But let me submit to you, those victories were not the ultimate source of the possession. Instead, what they had are all gifts from God. That's the perspective. That's the mindset. Because, because we need to understand that the Israelites people did not merit these gifts. Throughout the entire story, the entire stress, the entire emphasis is on the grace of God. I took, I gave, I sent, I destroyed, I delivered. Not a mention of the mighty men of Israel. Not man mentioned. Not any mention of the strategic greatness of Joshua. Why, 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 do I, why do I have to build this up? Because this is the key theological difference of what it means to worship the true God. That everything is by grace. That, that we do not deserve this salvation. And yet God has given to us. We do not merit it by good works or by keeping the law, or following the Ten Commandments. No, it is everything is by grace. It is grace that you have been saved. It is by faith. It, it, it is not of ourselves. It is not by works. It is a gift from God. So we could not boast. Ephesians 2, verse 8 to 9. There is only one name that you will be saved, and that is Jesus Christ. And that, the gospel, interwoven, in the farewell address of Joshua. God is not in the retail business, folks. Let me repeat this. He's not in the retail business. All our good deeds, our generous gifts, our religious activities, they cannot begin to buy our salvation. Some of us here, we go to church because we want to impress God. Some of us, we go to church because we want to earn brownie points. No. What you are doing should be the result, the being that springs into the doing. You see, God is willing to give it to us. When we receive Christ as our Savior, all that God has, it is for us, for the asking. And so I please, brothers and sisters, the Lord brought you here today because God is reminding all of us, we need to enjoy these gifts, the gift of eternal salvation. We're living as if we don't have eternal salvation. We live defeated lives. We live defeated lives. But come to think of it, it's already done. God has already purchased our salvation. We have gotten it going. We are assured of eternal salvation. That's why we should come and thank Him for providing them without price. Because Jesus paid for everything. They are yours not because you buy them or you work for them. They are ours because God gave it to us. And that is my first point. God is faithful. And if there's one thing that you could take home today, God is faithful. Be victorious. Choose God. Why? Because He is faithful. At this point, I want to call a brother in Christ who will share his wonderful testimony to us about God has been faithful in his life. Everybody, can we all welcome our dear pastor, Pastor Bert Villa.
Good morning, everyone. Way back in 1969, I found my professional niche in marketing via product management in multinational companies. Successes in four companies within 10 years brought changes in my lifestyle. I began to believe in such ideas as I am the master of my faith. I am the captain of my soul. I became self-willed and self-indulgent. I wanted wealth, popularity, power, a, wo a worldly lifestyle, and the usual thing, a family. I was already enjoying a certain level of this in the late 70s and early 80s, even when the economy was bad. Then in mid-1986, the multinational company I was working in was bought by a bigger one. I was retrenched. Suddenly, I was jobless. In the past, I, I'd have a new job in two months' time. But six months had gone by, but I still had no source of income. My growing family, with its growing needs, was fast depleting my resources. Inside me, I was worried. So much so that when a, fr a good friend and a golf buddy invited me to a weekly Bible study, a CCF Bible study, I accepted. There, I surrendered my life to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. By early June, we had our first small group meeting at home in Quezon City. I was still jobless then, but as I sought to be closer to our Lord by obeying and following Him, an amazing thing happened one Friday night before our small group meeting. Right after a short prayer, a special prayer for me to find a job, my next boss suddenly called me up a few minutes after to tell me to report for work the following Monday. Yeah, isn't God good? Praise God. But there's something more. Something more beautiful. In my welcome lunch that Monday, I asked my new boss, I'm just curious, I said, when did you decide to choose me? He answered, a few minutes before I called you up. Praise God, no? Yeah. And then I followed up. I said, why did you choose me? He said, I don't know, Bert. Something just prodded me. You know, praise God indeed. No? Isn't God amazing? Yeah, and another financial problem arose several years later. God was faithful. It was two weeks before Christmas, and I was flat broke. My wife and I just ate the last food in the house, or lunch. I did not know where to get the next meal. Around 3 p.m., a good Christian friend who did not know our plight and who, who had never been to the house before, he arrived and he dropped by to just wish me a Merry Christmas and, found, and, and gave me a greeting card. When he left, I opened the envelope and you know what? I found dollars in it, enough to sustain us for a month. Praise God, huh? When he, the Lord was just on time, but that's not all. The Lord is really overwhelming. Uh, at, eight, uh, no, at 6 p.m., a friend sent us 10 kilos of assorted meat. Two hours later, another friend came with the biggest ever Christmas goodies basket that I've ever seen. Wow. God's love and faithfulness is really wonderful. Yeah. My wife and I had our regular times with the Lord, and we never missed any CCF retreat, seminar, and training between 1987 and 1997. Our small group grew from 7 to 32 members. I can only attribute these things to God's favor and guidance. <laughs> Despite that I was doing simultaneously all these years, many things. Growing my relationship with the Lord, leading my wife, guiding my five children, working on the job, discipling some men, and leading small groups. 
by November of 1998, our senior pastor started talking to my wife and me about my becoming a pastor. After much prayer, I dropped corporate, the corporate world and plunged into full-time pastoring. I started in January of 1999 as an area pastor. And the Lord blessed me and, and blessed and grew the pastoral area and the good works ministries that he entrusted to me. Then the Lord raised the bar on my fifth year of pastoring. My wife, Joey, was diagnosed with stage three, breast cancer. She needed to go through mastectomy, chemo, radiation, and hormonal therapy. My apprehensions rose. How will I care for my wife? How will I pay for the huge cost of treatment? How can I continue raising my kids? How can I help them keep trusting the Lord? How can I do all of these things and still carry on the ministry? My family and I clung closer and tighter to the Lord. So much so that when my wife shared her testimony, she said, Lord, thank you for this cancer because it brings me and my family closer to you. And the Lord provided the, the answers, the solutions, and the resources. Soon after, however, the cancer spread. I brought my thoughts and feelings to the Lord. And he comforted and reassured me with his promises. He reminded me that he is the best to be with. And heaven is the best place to be in. So why should I be selfish to insist that my wife should remain with me with her worsening cancer. In late November 2004, my, wa my wife went peacefully with the Lord. The wake was a celebration of her eternal life with our Heavenly Father. To prevent the ex you know, my grief from going uncontrolled and maybe the loneliness, I kept myself busy with the Lord. His words and his works, and my family. There's nothing like loving, obeying, and serving him and leading others to do the same. After all, to be with him is the key to living a life and maybe after life of meaning, significance, and a lot of joy. I'm now a super senior at 76. I've been a solo parent for 18 years. I retired from my CCF administrative duties 11 years ago. By God's grace, I still shepherd the members of our pastoral area in the main and here in CCF Eastwood. I'm still discipling my D12, some young men, and my family. I still choose to continue to obey and serve the Lord. In a few months from now, I'll be 77. I can say that God is truly faithful and continue to be faithful in my life. I pray that the Lord will keep me faithful and strong to do more to shepherd his flock. And what Joshua said, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. The Lord Jesus Christ. To him be all the glory forever and ever. Praise the Lord. Hey, everyone. Can we, can we pray for Pastor Bert? Lord Jesus, we thank you for Pastor Bert. We thank you for being a super senior and yet still plays golf. And uh, thrives and ministers, but more importantly, still serves you. Truly, Lord, you have been faithful because that is who you are, a faithful God. Thank you for Pastor Bert's faithfulness. May you continue to give him good health, strength, perseverance, and allow him the blessing of finishing strong. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Thank you, Pastor Bert. Marami siya niyo, hindi pa buhay nung naging kristyano na si Pastor Bert. So anyway, God is faithful. Do you agree? Amen? Can I hear an amen on that? God is faithful. All right. So,
after asking Pastor Bert to tell us about his wonderful uh, testimony, let me, let me all shift gears as we go into our final two points. Joshua 24 verse 14 says, Because, when, it's, when you hear the word therefore, in lieu of what has been discussed, in what I have been sharing in the past 30 minutes about God's faithfulness, in lieu of that, what is our response? Because of God's overwhelming grace and mercy, Joshua is now issuing the commandments. Because of all that God has just done, everybody, can you read this with me? Fear the Lord, serve Him in sincerity and truth, and do away with God's which your Father has served. Which takes us to the second point for this morning's message. When we choose God, and because we want to live a victorious life, the way to do that is to obey, to set apart, and to serve. Obey, set apart, and serve. Joshua chapter 20, verse 5 to 7 says, Be de- very determined then to keep and do everything that is written in the book of the law of Moses so that you will not turn aside from it to the right or to the left. Joshua is reminding them, to, for you to continue to experience this blessing, you have to do this. You have to follow. You have to obey. Similarly, this phrase in the tail end of the book of Joshua is something similar. Tama ba? Something similar in, a, in the first chapter in the book of Joshua. One of our favorite verses in Joshua chapter 1, verse 7 to 8. It says, only be strong and be courageous. Everybody, be careful to do according to all the law which Moses, my servant, commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left, so that you may achieve success wherever you go. You see, Joshua was a great leader. He passed on to the people the very words that God gave him when he transitioned into the leadership of Israel from Moses to Joshua. You see, Joshua is a great follower. He followed Moses, and then when he became the leader, he followed God. Why why is this very important? Because obedience, setting apart, and serving is one of the best legacy as parents you could share to your children. Parents, all the parents who are here, I know there are a lot of parents here. Sige, marami rin ako ng single eh. Spiritual parents, di ba? Parent din naman kayo spiritually, right? The best gift, the legacy that you could give to your kids is your obedience to God. The best legacy that you could give to your kids is they seeing you that you're pursuing sanctification in your life. The best gift and legacy that you could give is to serve the Lord. Oftentimes, we think of financial resources, sending them to a good school, giving them a nice, you know, perhaps some of you who can afford car, for some of you who can give clothes. I think that's also the mindset, setting them up for a, for a trust fund or even an insurance, all of these things, right? Those are well and good, folks. But the legacy, the unquantifiable legacy, is the legacy of obedience to God. And they need to see that in our lives. Because as parents, as spiritual parents, it's something that you need to pass on. Joshua is saying, if you obey, if you keep the book of the law, if you keep the law of God, you will be blessed. Right? And that's why, be very determined. The path to possession is straight to the path of obedience. Let me repeat. The path to possession of the blessing of God is a straight path to obedience. So if you're here and you're being disobedient, then you need to ask yourself. Because here, one of the principles that Joshua in his farewell address is passing is the concept of obedience. You choose God when you obey God. The written authority, the written authority of God's word, Joshua is saying, look, Israelites, Israelites, don't, don't look at the Canaanites. Don't look at them. They will not give you the answer. You look at God's law because godly living, godly activity cannot be seen in the foreign people, in this foreign land. Similarly, I submit to you, we as brothers and sisters in the church, we live in a foreign land. The world is foreign to us. But a lot of us, we copy the foreign. We copy the world rather than we copy God's word into our lives. So the first principle 
to choose God is to obey. The second principle is the principle of setting up, setting apart. Sorry, setting apart, so that you will not associate with these nations. These which remain in you are mentioned the name of the of their gods, or make anyone swear by them, or serve them, or bow down to them. The second qualification for continued prosperity of the land involves separation. They were to separate from them. And again, further down in the chapter, in verse 12 and 13, the Lord again reminds them, you know with certainty that the Lord your God, again, the covenantal term, the Lord your God will not, will not continue to drive these nations out before you, but they will be a snare and a trap to you, a whip on your sides and a thorn in your what? In your eyes. Joshua is not hiding his apprehensiveness. Seven times he referred in these two chapters the issue on idolatry. Idolatry during that time was such a big thing, super big. Seven times he said to Joshua, do not associate, do not do that. And we apply this principle of setting apart, being set apart, because even nowadays, do you agree nowadays, idolatry still exists? Oh, wow. I share to you. Idolatry in the church today exists and it's, and it's a big issue. What is idolatry? An idol is something or someone that becomes more important to us than God. And that is what God is competing with. You see, because we think idolatry is talking to a statue or uh, having trinkets, I don't think you know idolatry, right? But we forget that idolatry is not confined to that. Idolatry is something that takes the place of God in our lives. In fact, even the good thing that God has blessed us at times become an idolatry. Do you know that? Why? Because that is the sinful consequences of a fallen world. Anything that is good can sometimes turn into bad. Right? I like what Ed Setzer said. Everybody read this with me. Is it that 12-inch tall piece of wood or bronze can do something bad to us? Or is it that we do something awful to ourselves? when we place adoration and attention that should go to God in other things. When it comes to idolatry, the danger is not an item. It is in us. That is the problem. We human beings are prone to this. And Joshua was telling the people, get away from that. And the Lord is telling all of us here this morning, get away from that as well. Let me just rattle off some quick, common Modern-day idolatry that perhaps you are not aware of. Number one, the idolatry of identity. This is a big thing nowadays. I, identity is one of the biggest idols we worship today. It fuels our pride. We largely abandon who we are in Christ and we place our identity in other things. Social media followers, position at work, our skills, our abilities, the achievements we have, even the way we physically look, we identify ourselves and wrap our things up in our wrong things. And our identity, unfortunately for some of us, has become an idol. And that is a tough way to live. If you're here and you're putting so much emphasis on your identity, it's a tough way to live. Why? Because the idol of idolatry of identity is a harsh master. A harsh master because it will never content you. It will always crave for more, 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 more. But there's no contentment because that is the black hole on the idolatry of identity. What about the, idol what about the idolatry of money and materialism? The Bible tells us, get away from that. Our culture has bowed down to this. The pursuit of money, the acquisition of things that is the guiding force for many, unfortunately, it's an idol. And listen, folks, make no mistake about it. You don't have to have money for money to be your idol. Let me repeat, you don't have to have money. It's not about what you have. It's about what you long for. So even poor people, even those that are destitute, can still look into money as idolatry. That is how sneaky this challenge is. And, my, and money can be an idol that quickly entraps us. Again, let me be careful. Money is not totally bad. But when it goes to the wrong direction, that's when the problem happens. Money 
has become the ultimate thing for many of us. But unfortunately, it will always fall short. There are many idolatries currently in the church today, but I don't have the time. I'm rushing. But let me just share one final idolatry that I'm sure is very relevant to the church today. The idolatry of comfort. What is this? There's an endless list of promising things products to simplify our lives. Ang dami na ngayon. Dati, it takes the whole day to do things. You can only do it in five minutes. Right? Everything is in our, you know, apps, 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 apps. Well, that is a good thing. Our pursuit in life should not be comfort alone. No. Let's be careful on this. There's also this idolatry of comfort of being entertained. You know? Netflix, TikTok, podcast, Everything. It has to be with this. We are obsessed with being entertained. Sorry, I should have used the word love, but it's obsession. It's an obsession to be comforted. It's an obsession to have be entertained. Folks, I'm sorry to say this, but we need to check this. Why? Because these are modern-day idols. When life becomes the search for ultimate comfort, when that is the search, you know the challenge? The challenge is when you are revolving around the pursuit of comfort, the pursuit of being entertained. If you're revolving around that, the problem is when God brings you into a situation that is uncomfortable, you will say no. Because you're used to that. So any challenge in schedule, any challenge in taking out of the way, ayaw mo na. Kasi yung comfort eh. Ayun na natin picture. Nakataas pa ah. Folks, we are called not into a life of comfort. We are called to a life of commitment to Jesus. And when we're asked, when we're asked to commit to Jesus, he said that life wouldn't be easy. He didn't say that. He didn't say that, hey, come to church and all your problems will go away. A lot of people are discipled wrong when it comes to church, when it comes to Christianity. We are actually fueling the culture of comfort rather than the future of God's calling in our lives. So challenge people. Challenge them to get out of their comfort zone. Stop cuddling people. Folks, we need to rise up from our chairs and stop being comforted because there's a world out there that needs you to go out there and tell them who about Christ is. But who among us here actually actively invites? Who? Let me submit to you. Sana wala rito yung pamilya ko kasi inimbita ko sila. Pero, you know, I've invited my family. They've always say no. Kangin na naman, nag-no na naman. Right, nandiyan ba kayo? Pakan bilang nandiyan? No, nag-no na naman, nag-no na naman. My idolatry of comfort tells me, stop inviting them. Wag na, give up. You know what? That's not what I'm being called to ask to do. I'm being called to call them to Christ. I'm not being called for comfort. So get up on our chairs, folks, and stop these idols penetrating our lifestyle today. Why? Why is that so important? Look, because they will be a snare, they will be a trap. A snare is like a bird cage. Have you seen a bird cage trap? You know? It's uh relate no? a bird cage trap. Oh, ito, baka meron. Mouse trap. Nakaka-relate ba kayo dito? Mouse trap. Oh, yan, better, right? That's the trap of idolatry. That's what Joshua is saying. Be careful. It looks appetizing. Pero pag kuha mo niya, once you touch it, once you stay there, boom! You're trapped. This is a picture of what looks like very alluring, but at the end, it's painful. It leads to destruction. And in fact, it leads to death. Check out the wordings. Check out the wordings. Whip on your sides. Thorns in your eyes. Have you, have you experienced that? It's gory. Thorns in your eyes. Ouch! That's idolatry. That's what sin will bring you. So that's why it says, get away from them. Set apart. Choose God. Because if you don't do that, you know what's going to happen? It will ruin us. It will ruin you. It will ruin your family. Be victorious. Choose God. Set apart. Serve. What is serve? 
you know, we talk about this, choose whom you will serve. Joshua is saying this, and he claimed, but as for me and my house, we will what? Serve the Lord. Joshua tells them, you have to make a choice. He wasn't inviting. He was demanding. Demanding to serve the Lord. He is about to go. He has made his choice. He followed his entire life. Pastor Bert did that. He made the choice. He said that my house will serve the Lord. Look, it's not says, unlike also Pastor Bert mentioned in his testimony, he said, but as for me in my house, I have served. He's a super senior at 77, but he's still saying, I will serve. So it's still future. It's not done. Meaning, the lifestyle is a, the service is a lifestyle. Hindi pwede pag tapos na, graduate ka na, resign ka na, hindi ka na magsaserve. By the way, serving has a narrow, has a narrow concept, but I don't have a time to explain it. But serving is not just being, serving is not just giving your time to the church, just one. But serving also means serving your family. Children, singles, serving your parents. Parents, serving your kids. Be group leader, serving one another. By the way, the word serve is not just you know serving, serving, no? Serving per se. But this word serve, avad, has the concept of worship. But again, I don't have the time. But that is what it means to serve the Lord. Right? And look, the thing is, choosing to serve the Lord is not an easy decision. Sometimes it's going to go against religious beliefs of your family. I get that. I know that. I've been the singles pastor for over 15 years. I know. I know that sometimes when you serve against your family's religious beliefs, it's challenging. I get that. But folks, the thing is, other times, even peer pressure, even family. But at the end of the day, you have to make a stand. Today, decide to make a stand. Who will you serve? Will it be yourself? Will it be the gods of pleasure, the gods of comfort, the gods of ease? Or you will serve God who loves you. Making a decision for Christ might be hard, but it's the best decision you would make. But let me share this to you. Sometimes, more often than not, the hard decisions are not the easiest one. That's why Joshua said, you cannot serve God. You people, you cannot serve God. He's mentioned that in in verse, in, in, in chapter 24. You could not serve God because God is a holy God. God is a jealous God. And you are using, you are allowing these idols to still stay in the land. You can't do that. You need to set yourself apart. And it's why today, you have to choose. My house, we will serve the Lord. Serve. Then finally, my last point is that to be victorious, you need to choose God. Why? Quick review. Why? Because God second, how do we do that? What do we do? Obey, set apart, then serve, and then lastly, you need to cling to God. Cling to God. Sometimes yung cling has a negative connotation. No? Ang clingy, clingy naman ito. Di ba? Di ba? Sobra mo naman clingy. Right? Pero pa nga ako na, no, I, like, I, I like mafia movies. Di ba? The mafia movies. Hey, if you want to make your friends something, sorry, make your friends, make your enemies closer to you, something like that, right? Tama ba yung ko? How, how, how's that? How do you say that again? Make your friends close, but your enemies closer. Yan, 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 yan. Sa mafia po yun. Sa Kristiano, hindi po pwede yun. Sa Kristiano, run away from your enemies. Flee. But the problem is, a lot of people, they are mentored shallowingly when it comes to transformative power of sanctification. First, it's not on our power, it's power of the Holy Spirit alone. You have to make that uh, clear. Then second, when you take something away, for example, a bad habit, for example, the habit of the addiction of smoking, for example, you're heavily addicted, for example, only. Or not, not lalaan na natin, drugs, right? Now you are addicted to drugs. When you take that addiction away, human nature says that that addiction will be replaced with something. Okay? So the way the mind works is that you need to do something about it. And that's why clinging to God, I want to share to you as, my, as, I, as I end my message this morning, is about you need to take great care, great care of yourself at, at loving the Lord your God. Meaning, it takes effort. 
Clinging to God takes effort and the way to cling to God is to love God. Cling. Napakagandang word. The back means to join, to be joined together, to stick so close. In fact, the operative word of glue comes from this original word, the back. So it's something that's so sticky, right? But for you to become sticky, especially in our time today, being sticky, being following, being loving God, so much difficult. But let me share to you a final note for this, eve, this morning, a concept. The antidote for apostasy, the antidote for being cold, the antidote for being vain into going to idols is loyalty and love to Yahweh. Thomas Chalmers said this. Everybody, can you read this? A little bit small, but can you read it? The love of God and the love of the world are two affections, not merely in a state of rivalship, but in a state of enmity, away, and so irreconcilable that they cannot dwell together the expulsive power of the new affection. The best way to disengage an impure desire of sinfulness is to pursue a desire of purity in God's love. The way, the way to push things out, to push this negative out, to push these idols away, to push this sinfulness away is to replace it with your newfound affection for Jesus. Do you know what happens during during in the seasons in the States, when the leaves start to fall off. Do you know what happened? Do you know why those leaves fall off? The leaves fall off not because of the wind. The wind not because, of, because it's fall or it's being winter. Scientifically, it's been proven the leaves fall off because it needs to make room for a new leaf. In Christian life, it's the same. You want to push this sinfulness away? You want to push and set apart away? Your love for God should grow. Your love for God should take root and that will push it away. A lot of people, they live defeated lives because their sinfulness and their challenges in life overwhelms them. And they want to change. They want to really change it. But they're doing it the wrong way. They're stopping the action, but they're not checking the root. The root is the heart. And the root has to be filled with so much love. You see, when a root, when the, when the challenge, when the, psycholo- when the psychology of the mind works, when you take away something, it leaves a vacuum. And that vacuum that is being left by that addiction, by that sinfulness, is going to be replaced. The key for that to be replaced is you need to fill your heart with so much fullness of God's love and joy and peace and kindness and generosity and all of that fruit of the Spirit. And when you have that, these things can never go back again. And that is the key to the expulsive power of a new affection. That's why, please, brothers and sisters, take great care of yourself so that your love for the Lord will grow. In fact, this is something that Joshua achieved. Joshua achieved in, in tail end of chapter 24. It said, everybody read this with me. She, Israel, served the Lord all the days of Joshua and all the days of the elders who survived Joshua and had known all the deeds of the Lord which had done for Israel. This sums up Joshua's life as a leader and sums up our series on victorious living because Joshua chose God to follow God, obey Him, and serve it, and set apart, He lived a victorious life. And not only Him, the people around Him. We in CCF emphasizes the family. Family is a big thing in CCF. Fathers, mothers, what you do impacts your family. What you do impacts the family. Not a lot of leaders can claim, can claim on what Joshua experienced. Not a lot. The entire Israel served the Lord until Joshua died. And even throughout the lives of other leaders who would be Joshua, through a summary glance of Joshua's leadership, it seems that he was truly a victorious life. God gave him directions. Joshua followed them, and Israel was greatly blessed. So why? Folks, why is Joshua's example such a rare item in the church today or in the history of the world. Maybe I share it to you as I close because Joshua understood that he wasn't a primary a leader, but he was primarily a follower, a follower of God. 
he let God call the shots. And when Joshua acted in, you know, without God's specific instructions, he made mistakes. He's not perfect. But when he did listen to God's commands, he, par- he followed them with unparalleled courage. Unparalleled. Sobra. We need more of these people in the church today. God compared, commanded him to lead his people, which involves being strong. You need to be strong. Our church needs to be strong. We need to be courageous. We need to be obedient. You see, when courage, when strength, when submission falls in the same place of the same man, dynamite. Dynamite. The power of God will really transform. He lived up to the name the Lord truly brings salvation. So folks, as I close this morning, if you are looking for that secret ingredient to really live a victorious life, as we close this series, don't look at Joshua. Look at God. His power, His word, His faithfulness, they're all available to us. Then, as you look to God, look at yourself. What is really motivating me to pursue the things that matter most in my life today? You see, if what is you're pursuing is popularity, achievement, money, and fame, it's going to be a challenge because you could never truly live a victorious life. But if serving the Lord is your definition of success, God will give you the strength, God will give you the courage to fulfill your purpose and truly live a victorious life. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you for this wonderful time that you've blessed us with the privilege of going through 24 chapters from the book of Joshua over the past couple of weeks. Lord, living a victorious life is something that the church really wants, people want to have, families want to have, communities want to have. But oftentimes, this victorious living falls short because we don't know how to do it. Today, as we have discussed over the past hour, the key in living a victorious life and sustaining that is to choose you. To choose you because you are faithful. To choose you and how we do that is to obey your word. To set ourselves apart and to experience the blessing of serving you with all our hearts. And when things go rough and when things become challenging, because it will help us all to cling to you. Clinging to you means to stick to you, the back, to be with you. And Lord, as we close this message this morning, I realize that we will fail you in our desire to cling to you. But let our encouragement be this morning that even if we don't cling to you you will always cling to us because that is your promise your word said that and your character speaks of that that no matter how we do your love for us will be consistent and may that truly change us transform us to have that desire to cling to you to follow you and to obey you. Father, we praise you and Father, we give you all the honor and glory. In Jesus' mighty name we pray and God's people. Amen. Thanks everyone. God bless you all.